Magic Glass. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Death Curse Society. Halloween is over. October is over. We're creeping into November, and it's time to talk about some more horror news for you. I'm Red Crank, I got the Colonel, and I got Zigzag. What you reading there, Ziggy? Hmm? What you reading there? Can't put it down, man. The uh -huh. ghost. This What's guy the is telling a story, and it's good. Believe it. Charles Sherrod Jr., Later on in the episode, we are going to review Redwood Massacre Annihilation, which is available on video on demand now. We're going to also review Creep Show, their animated special that they just dropped on Shudder. We're going to talk about Voorhees, the new Friday the 13th fan film, and the short film Pathosis that is also available right now on YouTube. Later on, we're also going to talk a little bit about the news that Jordan Peele is producing a remake of People Under the Stairs and Tom Holland returning to Fright Night. That could be interesting. But before we get to any of all that good stuff, we're going to let you know we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Please follow and subscribe us. And I hope you voted this week, people. It's time. Let's go camp. Ooh, you're going to camp blood, ain't you? Never come back again. It's got a death curse. For Let's Go Camping this time around, we're going to get a little witchy on you this time. We're going to review The Craft Legacy, which is the latest sequel from Bloomhouse that connects to the original 1996 movie, The Craft, from Andrew Fleming. This one is about an eclectic foursome of aspiring teenage witches. They get more than they bargain for as they lean into their newfound powers. Let's start with Ziggy on this. Your initial thoughts, sir. I see why they called it a sequel, and it's not really a direct sequel. I guess that's the trend now. Just take movies from 30 years ago and just pick up the story. It's loosely connected. It's packed to the brim with the current social climate issues going on it's not bad it's not great it's not great by any means the original is way better story-wise with uh, with the girls and I, i'll tell you what i'll get right to it the little easter egg at the end they could have did the whole movie about that it would have been a hundred times better movie than what they gave us well that easter egg at the end is the thing that makes it a sequel i ain't that's right the exactly only thing that makes it a sequel other than that Two minutes that makes it a sequel, and then it's another 90 minutes of a reboot, basically, in my opinion. Very woke, but I appreciate that they did not rub it in my face as much as the movie that shall go unnamed. I watched it with my preteen daughter. Granted, there's one scene, I'm like, turn your head, you know. I know she doesn't know this girl's flicking her bean, but I know very well that she's flicking her bean. No. And here's the difference. I didn't care for the movie. She loved it. Mm -hmm. She is the audience they're speaking to. There's no storyline. They blew through it. It's like, okay, at least in the original, you saw them practice and learn their powers. These bras already fucking had it going. Like, there was no build up, nothing. And then they didn't throw it in your face, but you know, towards the end, the whole toxic male masculinity, I'm all for equal rights, but I like to be like, I still like to be treated like a man from time to time on certain things. So I guess that makes me slightly toxic. Not Flint water toxic, but close. Yeah, and that little twist at the end, if that's what you want to call it, which I figured out as soon as I hit a plot point. I just wasn't surprised as a period that starts in the first period. The reveal at the end had been speculated about ever since this movie was announced. It wasn't a surprise. It wasn't well hidden. They almost should have done that halfway through the movie so we would have cared more about that character a little bit. It could have um, fucking started right there. And just kind of rearrange that script a little bit. I know, I'm with you, because then you could have brought that character back at the end. And could have did more with it. Yeah. But perhaps that's the idea. Perhaps we're looking at a fucking bunch of sequels coming. I personally didn't feel these characters were anywhere near strong enough to warrant going back and visiting with them again. The main actress, Kaylee Spaney, who played Lily, I liked her character. The others were a little... Personally, for me, too annoying, but I assume that's closer to what teens are like anymore. Those three made Keanu Reeves look like an Oscar-winning, multi-time winner. That's all I'm saying. But Kaylee Spaney, I thought, did a, a good job. David Duchovny, as soon as you saw him, I knew he was the bad guy. 
basically. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but that was oh, yeah. really obvious. I will get into the societal issues that you brought up in a little bit, but I want to first talk about the connections to the craft. Do you think that one thing can hold that movie together and create more sequels, Colonel? Hold it together? No. Create sequels? Yeah. There's a buck to be made. Of course it's going to create sequels, and especially if you can bring back the majority of the original cast from the craft as this story goes on if they do it. Who knows? Might even have some house fires. I'm missing those. Again, it's hard. I don't want to speculate on it too much. Like like I've said, I'm going to say it again. A 35-year-old male was not the target audience for this film. I was very aware of that. This wasn't much of a horror film, really. It was more of a teen drama. Personally, I'm, I'm not a fan of the film, but I do kind of see the importance of it in kind of a radically changing society like we're, like we're in now. Absolutely. A couple of times I went, yeah, this is just like Twilight on MTV, Teen Wolf, Scream, whatever you want to call it, of those kind of sparkly teen kind of shows. Just a little bit better executed, I think. It, you know, it looks good. It's a, it's a well shot film. As far as just spawning sequels and everything, eh, maybe it's better set up as an episodic, you know, weekly show like that because you can do that then. You can look at Cobra Kai, the way they introduce mm-hmm. old characters in and out of the thing. It's great and it works. Why not do it with the craft? I believe it, and it would be huge, you know, big cliffhangers to bring back Sarah, and, you know, Nev Campbell could make an appearance. Hell, you know, they're all around still. They're not doing nothing. In movie form? I don't know, man. You're asking a lot. Well, like Colonel mentioned, though, we are not the target audience. This would definitely work for teen, preteen kids, mostly girls, even early adult women would probably get into this. Yeah, it's engineered for that. It's they're, they're, it's engineered for exactly that. It definitely followed that blueprint, didn't it? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, and Colonel mentioned, you know, they might have house fires later on. We didn't get a house fire in this one, but you, they did have a fire. Must one have fire in the final act in a Blumhouse film. I'm just going to say this because Colonel called it a woke film. Yes, it is. But they handled it in a way that didn't come across too preachy, I thought. Like Colonel mentioned, not like another Blumhouse production that shall not be named from Never. last Christmas or so. Most witch tales and films are allegories about being different and the importance of embracing those differences anyway. And I thought this one did it fairly well. I didn't hate this movie. I can definitely see the importance of it for a younger teen audience, for people that are coming out of their shell, trying to figure out who they are. And if you're a little different, that's fine. One of the examples of the societal issues that they talk about in this movie, one of the actors is a trans woman, and she plays a teen trans woman. It gets mentioned once, and that's it. It doesn't get shoved in your face. They're not making fun of her. It just gets mentioned, and then they move on with the story. And they even kind of tie it into partially what the story is about. Did you guys like the way they handled these these issues or, or address them? Or was it too much or too preachy for you, Ziggy? No, hell no. It's, an, it's not in your face, and that's the point. It, it actually applies to the story. It applies to the characters. So, yeah, it works, and it worked. they executed it just fine. I had no problem. I didn't feel like I was getting a talking to by society or anything like that. It's not an obstruction or a distraction in any way. No, I mean, I thought they did a fairly good job of it's there, but it's not there. Mm-hmm. You know, they did it the right way. Uh, like I said, towards the end, that's when, to me, it was a little bit, it went from here to not quite here to like here. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's when they started putting it in your face a little bit, but it made sense for the ending. The ones I really liked was uh, when that asshole kid was making fun of the gay dude in the hallway, and it made his jacket turn rainbow colored. I was like, ah, like I, I, I dug that because <laughs> I appreciated it this way. I didn't mind being told I'm a bad person because I'm a white man in my mid thirties. Like I appreciated it. We're not all bad. Well, and you're straight. That's an issue, yeah, you know. That is true. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a breeder. I'm sorry. For those of you that might be on the younger side, especially if you're a horror fan, you're going to be looked at as different. Embrace your differences. Don't be afraid of them. Don't run away from them. If you enjoy this movie, that's great. It's not made for us. This movie is made for for you, possibly. And that's fine. I can't really hate this movie. I tried to go in with open eyes and clean the slate of my preconceived notions, you know, like a good reviewer should. And I think I did that. And I really didn't mind this movie as much as I really thought I was going to, uh, based on it coming from Blumhouse and the way they've handled societal topics in some of their other films. 
based on the fact that I really am not a big fan of sequels, remakes, reboots, blah, 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 blah. And I'm not a 13 year old girl. So I figured I would hate this movie and I really didn't. And that surprised the hell out of me. Let's score it. You guys ready for that, Colonel? Again, get a reviewer. Clean slate. I didn't hate the movie, but I didn't like it either. I was pretty much indifferent. I understood what it was doing. The original craft was way better storyline. That's what really hit this movie to me. There's no, not much of a storyline. Just kind of rushed through this shit. I would appreciate watching them actually learn their magic instead of just going, Shh, and they got makeup and shit on. You know, I was like, I want to give it a lower score than probably want to just because the target audience that I watched it with love the movie. So I'm going to have to give it a five out of 10. It looks good. It's decent. The ending, the, the twist is predictable. I guess you could be wondering which one. I'll leave it at that. I didn't hate it either. I'm going to go ahead and give The Craft Legacy a six. For The Craft, I'm going to give it a six as well. I thought it told a story well. It told Lily's story well, and that's what this movie is. It's really Lily's story. It's Lily finding who she is in multiple ways. Like I said, Kaylee Spaney. The actress who played that role did a tremendous job. Zoe Lister-Jones, who wrote and directed this film, I thought did a, a great job of redoing the craft for a, a newer, woke audience, if you will. Kudos to them. And I'm not necessarily interested in seeing more, personally, but I'm sure there will be more. So mm. got a couple of sixes and a five. Not too bad for something a couple weeks ago we were like, uh, like worried we were going to hate. Not too bad at all. That whole connection, they could have did so much more with that. And that, that is very disappointing. It could have had more. If there was more of that, I probably would have gave it a higher score. Yeah. Well, they dropped the ball a lot. I think I see what Colonel's saying, and I noticed that too. There were a lot of scenes that you thought were going to finish on like a, a kind of a high note or something. And then just they just ended. And you're like, that's it? There was, a, there was a lot of that. And even a lot of, there was some character development that didn't go all the way through like I thought it would. The payoff wasn't there. It was odd having a real villain, too, instead of the witches themselves being the villains to the one witch, you know, in the first one. Right. Well, guys, that's going to wrap it up for Let's Go Camping. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Death Curse Society right after this. Death Curse Society has just become an associate producer on the film. Yes. Bravo. Bravo. Death Curse Society, guys, is so awesome. Um, I met the guys, all three of the guys, at Indianapolis last year for Horror uh, Horror Hack. And I met those dudes, and I got to tell you, like, I hung out with them. We took pictures. I signed some stuff. They gave me a T-shirt. It was was awesome. awesome. They are awesome guys. So... Uh, super cool. I am so glad to have them on board this this campaign and also on board the film. And now they are going to be IMDb credited uh, as producers on this movie. Hi, this is Heather Langenkamp and you're watching Death Curse Society. Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Welcome back to Death Curse Society, guys. We got a lot to talk about in a short amount of time. You know how this goes. So it's time for stories around the campfire. I don't want to scare anyone. But I'm going to give it to you straight about Jason. Hey, come back, come back. First up on stories around the campfire... We're going to review the latest movie, Redwood Massacre Annihilation, that is available right now on Video On Demand, starring Daniel Harris. Who wants to start with this one? We're going to start with Ziggy on this one. We love Daniel Harris. It's no secret. We do. And she doesn't look as bad as how the trailer made her look for some reason. But... Another fucking wasted, you had a good looking slasher, you had something to build on, you throw this weird angle into it, you kill off your survivor Friday the 13th part two style right away and lead us into this whole hunt for this killer with heavy guns, which don't ever apply into the story. It ends on a very strange and annoying, to say the least, way. 
trying to build a franchise here, whether we like it or not. I guess that's the only way to put it. A couple of good kills, but not much else to go on with this whole thing. Not many good jump scares even. I will say this. The gore is good in this. How about you, Colonel? What do you think of Redwood Massacre Annihilation? Not at all, because unfortunately I'm a terrible co-host this week and I don't have much to say about anything. Are we going to make him play his card for that at least? Oh, I'm playing my card. All but right. This shit, I'm out. <laughs> I'm saying I'm down a card already. Shit, he's got to be down a card too. I'm, due to time restraints, Colonel has to play this, but this shit, I'm out. I almost used my one of my cards for the craft, and I'm actually I'm glad I didn't. I don't know if it was necessarily worth 20 bucks, but it's it's worth a view. Redwood Massacre, it's a movie that establishes a nice tension in the second act, but then destroys it by introducing, like you mentioned, this ridiculous twist in the third act. The gore's on point, but there are also many character choices included, I think, for shock value. Those always bother me. There's a guy that's dressing up as the mass killer, fucking a dead body in front of uh, her husband. This plot is confusing, man. You know, it's moments like that that I think are just there for shock value that kind of cheapen the film. Danielle Harris is basically the shining light of this film. Not just because she's in it, but she actually got to act a little bit in this. I mean, this featured quite a range of performance for her. Emotions from being like a badass bitch to pent-up anger to scared to sad. Her character went through a lot in this movie. Honestly, her performance is pretty much the only thing that kept me interested at all. Ziggy, obviously, do you see more coming from this? Yes. It's, th- that ending is just blatant, and it just sucks because it's forced. It's absolutely forced. I don't know. I think we should entice him to watch it. You fucking waste your time on it. Thank God it was only six bucks. But I mean... I think mine was only like four or three. Don't see that? You you got better off than I did. I miss the days when a movie ended and you thought the killer was dead and you were sitting there and you, but you know, there's going to be a sequel like, like many of the Friday the 13th movies. Jason's got an ax in his fucking head. Jason's, you know, chopped to pieces by Tommy Jarvis, you know, something, something has happened to him. You think he's dead. You have to figure out How's he going to come back in the next one? This one, movies anymore don't even seem to bother with that kind of a mental trial in the audience's head. They just are like, oh, he's not dead. Coming back to Vegas soon. You know, and they throw that at you like, why are they taking this guy to Vegas? You know, and shit like that. So in the original Redwood Massacre from 2014, the actors and the, the characters are all Irish. So it's strange to me. That the first one is mostly got an Irish dialect, and then all of a sudden, here come the, the English. There's no explanation for that whatsoever. Now they're going to move it to America somehow, and come on now. Ziggy, you seem frustrated. You know, outside of the one obvious connection with our twist involving that character, this is a standalone movie. It has nothing to do with that first one at all. I would think it's going to go on that way. They'll probably have very little to do aside from maybe the mask. After sitting through this and the most unsatisfying of endings, this movie for me gets a four. Colonel, we won't bother to get a rating from you. N.A. Not a villain. We'll come, we'll come back. Fuck this shit, I'm up. <laughs> that's, his, that's his rating. I'm going to give it a five and literally four and a half stars of that goes to Danielle Harris. The other half star is the movie. The one thing I don't like about this killer is the fact that he he almost thinks too much about how he's going to kill somebody. Mm. This guy, he's got like a plethora of weapons always nearby, and he's like, hmm, what am I going to use today? You know, he's more like a kind of a serial killer kind of thing, and that drives me nuts. You know, he looks good. I mean, I think he's like a killer you'd see in that game Dead by Daylight. He's kind of Jason Bill, but he's got like a sack mask on that's got the X's, almost like he's in the band Mushroom Head, something like that. You know, but uh, it looks good, and he's intimidating and shit, but, man, I don't know. It's just the, the application here is just fucking weird. A five and a four, correct, for Redwood Massacre Annihilation. Available on demand right now, on video on demand. Check it out if you dare. And let us know if you agree with us in the comments. 
Next up on Stories Around the Campfire, we had a chance to check out the new animated special from Creep Show that's on Shudder right now for Halloween. Colonel, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, when they first announced this, I was fucking hyped because I'm so ready for season two of Creep Show. So we get it. You get a 45 minute animated special, uh, two stories, survivor type, written by uh, Stephen King, and you have Twittering from blah, 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 Circus of the Dead. It sounds like a Rob Zombie album title because it's so fucking long by Joe Hill. The Survivor type, great fucking story. Keith or Sutherland, Sutherland killed it doing the voiceover on this. Fucking fantastic. Like, it was such a good story. Such an odd fucking story. Perfect. This was creepiest show of a creep show. You know, this is what I came to expect. Then let's move on to Twittering, blah, 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 Circus of the Dead. Love the modern take on this world. Uh, this, this, it's about a teenage girl just tweeting everything, every thought she ever had. And you get fucking zombies, and it's fucking phenomenal. Again, another great voiceover, 45 minutes. Perfect, 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 perfect. It did take me a little while to get used to the animation because it's like you're watching an animated comic book. It's a lot of stills with very few movements. So once I got used to that, I actually had to start over once I got used to the animation style. Started back over from the very beginning and went on. Honestly, my only real complaint is when we did get a live action shot of the creep and it, it's leftover parts from the fucking Walking Dead, man. I'm sorry. I can't get over that. <laughs> <laughs> You're having a hard time with that. I know you've been having a hard time with no. that. Oh, you have been over that by now. No, apparently I can hold a fucking grudge. I thought it was a fun use of the comic book style animation. It was not a lot of motion, like you mentioned, but subtle movements that made it feel like a living comic. I thought that was kind of a cool way to do it rather than it being like a full-on Pixar kind of animated special. Survivor Type is a great Stephen King story that has been a challenge to adapt for a long time, for either the big or small screen. A lot of people have tried to do this, and they hadn't been able to figure out a way to do it. And then Greg Nicotero comes along and says, we'll just animate it. How about that? And boom, perfect. And then you cast one of the greatest fucking recognizable voices of all goddamn time in it with Kiefer Sutherland. Sorry, I like Kiefer Sutherland. Greg Nicotero took a chance to do this here, and it did well. As for Twittering from the Circus of the Dead, it's a fun, albeit predictable, tale of horror on the American highway. I like the modern-day way it's told. I did have this weird thought that Imagine if the Griswolds from National Lampoon's Vacation had taken a wrong turn and encountered something like this along the way to Wally World or something. I think that would have been fun. There's some dark humor to it that fits that kind of thought. Again, Kiever Sullivan is great in this, even just using his voice. I will, I will say I did enjoy his attempt at a Jersey accent. I thought it was a fun 45 minutes and like Colonel said, perfect time run. I, you guys got it pretty much covered, man. But this was, wow, what a refreshing re-entry into the creep show world after, you know, kind of a mediocre dive in with season one. This was really cool, man. I mean, you could get away with so much more doing it in this style. And as long as you get actors that come in, albeit maybe not the perfect accent at times, we're still going to commit to it and go for it. We're going to have great storytelling. I loved it, man. I, I'd love to see more. It just makes me want to get into season two and hopefully this storytelling continues into the real world of film and beyond the animation while you're on a roll give it a score it's great man perfect run time and in the middle finger just needed to give to the people that took away the great pumpkin charlie brown i'll give creep show the animated special a seven Again, perfect timing. Exactly what we needed right before Halloween. Creep show, the anime special. I give you an eight out of ten. I'm going with eight too, guys. We're 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 clicking on all cylinders. Right. We're like we're like right there with everything. I don't get it. I don't I don't understand why. That's called a callback for you people that don't you know. So check out the Creep Show animated special. It's available right now on Shutter. And if you don't have Shutter, I don't know why we have to keep saying this. Get off your ass and do it. They got they had well, you probably missed a chance, but they had a 31 day free trial for Halloween not that long ago. You yeah. fucked up. Man, that is true. Fucked up, man. Now you gotta pay 56 bucks, which is still a fucking deal, man. It's worth it. Check it out. Shutter. Let us know what you think. 
All right, next up on Stories Around the Campfire, we have a new Friday the 13th fan film that just dropped on Halloween called Voorhees from Wet Paint Pictures. Before we get started on this, I'm just going to say my mother taught me a long time ago, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. All right, I'll handle this. Voorhees, the fan film. There's lots of fan films. This feels and looks like a fan film, plays like a fan film. The acting's awful. Jason looks okay. He's decent. The story is entirely too long. How am I doing, boys? You on with me still? Yes. I'm going to keep going. It's a fan film, man. It's I, We encourage fan films to be made, and we love to see it, but this one, if you got an hour and a half, hour and th- 39 minutes you don't need in your life. Go ahead and check out Voorhees, but you know, it's on you, man. That's all we're going to say about that. That's it. it... <laughs> Sum it up in one word, Colonel. Uh... <laughs> I understand. So, Voorhees is available on YouTube for free from Wet Paint Pictures. Feel free to check it out. Let us know what you think in the comments. Okay, moving on. From Womp Stomp Films, also available on YouTube right now, is the award-winning short film, Pathosis. It also dropped on Halloween. Let's talk about that. Ziggy, what'd you think of this one? Man, is this thing creepy. Mm-hmm. I was on, I was tuned in. Maybe I was ready for it, you know, but this shit is great. It's about just under 13 minutes. It's a, It's great. It's really creepy. If you like your kind of, uh, it almost has a ring kind of feel to it. Good, though. <laughs> it's, it's scary, actually. It's actually scary. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Pathosis was short and effective with a simple story arc, and it plants it quickly in a reality for too many of us that have to deal with medicating our minds. The creature was creative and scary without taking away from the story. It's well acted for the most part. I thought Mark's character, uh, played by Never Hike Alone's uh, Andrew Leedy, I did think he would have been more frantic about the ending that happens. I don't want to necessarily give it away, but he seemed a lot more calm than I would have been. The one thing I didn't really like, I didn't like the last line. I thought the last line, it seemed like overkill and forced. I would have been, I think, just a... A scream or a, oh no, would have been more effective there. Uh, It did kind of kick it off into that uh, Resident Evil G.I. Joe kind of realm. It was like a Sarah Connor moment from Terminator 2 at the end. And that just seemed, like I said, like overkill for me. Overall, pretty strong film from writer-director Austin Bonang. You want to rank this one? I'll give this one an eight for shorts. I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to give it a nine. I thought it was pretty damn well done. Like some complained about the length of Voorhees. This is the right length. Pathosis. It's available right now from Womp Stomp Films on YouTube. Go check it out. Let us know what you think. Next up on Stories Around the Campfire, news is broken. The Jordan Peele is going to be producing a reboot remake of People Under the Stairs. Let's talk about it a little bit. Colonel, what do you think? In Jordan Peele's hands, I'm all for it. He could go wrong, but I don't think he will. Let's be honest, I enjoy people under the stairs, but to me, it's not one of these sacred movies that you cannot touch. This one, I, honestly, I think in today's political climate is due for a touch-up because it had those social economic undertones in the original. Perfect timing for it now. Right. I was going to mention that. I mean, there are other directors out there and, and producers out there, of course, that can also do it. But I think Jordan Peele's the right choice for it. Ziggy, what do you think? Yeah, man, excited. Wes Craven's People Under the Stairs. Albeit the first time I saw it, the way they cut the trailers on TV made it look like something completely different and much cooler. And I was disappointed with it. But then after, you know, years now, I it's right there on the shelf. And I pop it in a couple times a year. And in Jordan Peele's hands, how could it not work? This is going to be great. And I can't wait for it. I think we're all in agreement there. Can't wait to see this. Looking forward to hearing more news about it as it progresses. When we hear, we'll let you know. Another piece of news we're going to talk about is Tom Holland is thinking about returning to Fright Night. 
with a possibility of a Fright Night 2 resurrection, which brings the question of, wasn't there already a Fright Night 2? Colonel, you want to talk about this? Of course there's a Fright Night 2. That's 2020. That shit don't matter anymore. We had a Halloween 2. We had a Halloween 2018. Throw that shit out the fucking window. Anything can happen. Of course, the rumor mill is we got Jerry Dandridge coming back. We have Evil Ed coming back. I'm fu- How are they going to bring him back? Fuck, I don't know. But I want to see it. I want to see it. Fright, like, Fright Night's my go-to of the Fright Night 3 Fright Night movies. I'll be honest, I haven't seen the remake. But Fright Night 2 was okay, but wasn't fucking Fright Night. Happy to see Colonel excited about something. That was, that was nice. You don't see that very often. Ziggy, what do you think about it? When I read... Tom Holland wants to reboot Fright Night with Jerry Dandridge, Caretaker Billy, Evil Ed, Charlie Brewster. That's all I needed to hear. Shit, Negro. That's all you had to say. That's what I want, man. That is that is going to be good. Make this happen. What do we need to do? Where's the crowdfunding? Let's get on this, folks. We need this. I don't think he needs our help with this. Just maybe when when it comes out, just go see it, you know. Mm. Yeah, Fright Night is one of those, you know, it's a top-tier vampire story from the 80s. I'm excited to see a modernized look at what's been going on with these characters for a while. It's going to be interesting to see how the characters have aged. You know, vampires don't age, but... This one does? I don't know. We'll see. Maybe, or maybe they'll invest in that. Maybe they'll do the Irishman trick and de-age them or something. But I'm interested in this. I'm, I'm definitely curious to see what more we hear about it beforehand. That's just, I love the rumor mills. I love the stories that we get from behind the sets. Should be interesting. So stay tuned for more information about Fright Night 2 Resurrection. We'll bring it to you right here. Let us know what you think. Guys, that's going to wrap it up for Stories Around the Campfire and our latest episode. Ziggy, send them out for the night. If this show right here isn't enough of you to see our beautiful faces, well, you're in luck. Monday Maniacs is here for you. It's us in the live, in the raw. Not in the buff, though. We don't go that far. But, man, we got a live chat. We'll have a discussion We'll throw a topic up there, and then we get you people involved right with us in the comments, and we talk back in real time. It's like having a real conversation, except you can't smell the kernel. It's awesome. Monday Maniacs, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook and YouTube. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Definitely subscribe to us on YouTube. We're creeping up on 400 subs. We're looking for more, so tell your friends about us, and we re- we appreciate every sub, every follow, every like, everything. Thank you, guys. Colonel, what about you? All right, as you guys can see on the screen right now, we've got two beautifully designed T-shirts that can easily be yours. Uh, just go to paypal.me slash DCS. We've got the classic Death Chris Society logo, and we've got the Shady Loomis logo. What is there not to like? Free shipping. Small to extra large is 20 bucks, 2x to 5x, 25. You got to pay a little bit extra tax, and still no shipping. And we promise it will not come out smelling like Zag, which would be stale potato chips and weed. It's going to smell new. It's going to smell fresh. You're going to fucking look fresh. You're going to love it. That's extra. And I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's going to smell like a patchouli pizza in there. That's just rough. Our next episode, gang, will be November 19th. We're going to be reviewing the new Vince Vaughn movie, Freaky, which is supposed to be in theaters on the 13th. So hopefully my theater stays open that long. It's it's not looking good, folks. Mine's shut down already, so I'm fine. Mine mine was open for seven for seven days, and then now it's open five days a week. Now it's open three. And I'm like, oof. It's getting bad. Keep eating those stale chips. That's, that's it for us tonight. For the Colonel. And we. <laughs> for the Colonel. For Zigzag. This is Red Crank saying DCS out. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Be safe out there, everybody. Woo! What? Woo! Huh? Huh? God damn it, Colonel. <laughs> uh, Genetic jackhammer. Oh, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hold on now. Hold on now. Well, that's going to wrap it up for Let's Go Camping. Oh. Try it again. Yeah. Have fun. Oh, that shit. One more time.
I forgot. So stupid. Like two people that watch our show have seen the craft are going to get that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. But somebody might go watch the craft after watching our show yeah. and they'd be like, that's why they were fucking snapping at the end. <laughs> hey, wait, we just stood with the fucking the toxic masculinities, didn't we? That's what's funny about it. That's, oh. that's the joke. <laughs> yeah. You bastards. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Blooper reel. Better be in the fucking credit reel. Yeah, I'll throw that in the credit reel. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need to say. Whoop. There's some more for the credit reel. <laughs> God damn it. I might have the one fucking up. It's drug abuse. Careful now. If you keep moving too much, you're going to knock Colonel Set over. You will. Settle down, Zag. Settle down. <laughs>